Hi everyone, this is Phil Travis and it's week three here at Eastern Oregon University, History 480. And this week we are going to be examining the first of two weeks. We're going to be examining the Progressive Era. Uh, we're going to be reading from our textbook, the Gene Sone book. We'll be reading chapters one and three. I also have uh, a short primary source reading, uh, the Social Darwinist Debate one essay from William Graham Sumner, The Social Darwinist, the other essay from Henry George, the author of Progress and Poverty. Um, and I want you to read those primary sources for our discussion this week. Uh, that's a Gilded Aid discussion about, about wealth inequality and opportunity um, in the United States during the Gilded Age. And it's within the backdrop of that discussion that the progressive era is really launched. And the progressive era generally runs from 1901 to the end of Woodrow Wilson's presidency, 1921. We also have our book review that is due this week. The book review is on the, the book Benevolent Assimilation that we've been reading for the last, well now, three weeks on the American war in the Philippines um, at the turn of the 20th century. And uh, that book review, there's very specific guidelines, and I have a book review sort of checklist, a sort of guideline for writing these book reviews posted in modules for this week. I also have two sample book reviews for you as well. And I certainly encourage you to, you know, go to JSTOR, go to our digital uh, resources from our library and, uh, and search for history journals and search for sample book reviews. Um, you can access our, our digital databases in our library and you can access some of the historical journals there and uh, you can search for book reviews. Historians, one of the major things that historians do is write book reviews and publish them. And so reading book reviews, reading book reviews even on the book that you're reviewing this week can really help you to, to learn how to, to do this. Because writing a, in this case, a 600 word book review uh, can be very, very challenging. So make sure you see that checklist, those guides that I have um, on the book review. Make sure you see the sample book reviews and you might even look for some other ones to make sure you kind of, kind of get a feel for, for this type of exercise. If any of you go into graduate school um, for history, you will basically be asked to write a book review like this pretty much every week on a new book. And uh, scholars ask you to do this because one, uh, it's something that historians will do all the time as professional historians. I'm a book reviewer. Um, so it's something you will do. You will publish book reviews. It also allows you to really, the more you do this, it, it helps you to understand sort of where books fit into the historical narrative. And so when you get to graduate school, if you, if you take that route, um, you know, preparing for things like your pre prelim exams, being able to evaluate book reviews and understand where different authors and different books fit within the historiographical context is very important. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very valuable ex uh, exercise, I think. So that book review is due Sunday by midnight. Uh, make sure you see the guidelines on the book review uh, so that you make sure that you uh, write the review properly. This week we are, we are dealing with the progressive era. We'll have two weeks on the progressive era. The progressive era is really um, an incredibly significant uh, historical period for the United States. Uh, the Progressive Era is an era of like robust reform in the United States, driven largely from the problems, driven largely from the problems, I don't know if you heard my dog Mossy barking, but driven to a large degree by the problems of the Gilded Age, the late industrial period of the 1800s, well, the industrial period during the late 1800s. And... <clears throat> The Gilded Age, there were many issues of, of wealth inequality. There were many issues uh, in concerning uh, um, labor, unsafe working conditions, uh, environmental problems, uh, worker safety problems, food safety problems, just to mention a few, political corruption, um, a lack of direct democracy. Um, these were all issues of the Gilded Age, which of course was coined by Mark Twain uh, during the late 1800s to sort of refer to this period, a period that seemed tremendous on the outside, but had many, many problems underneath. And the progressive era was to a large degree driven by grassroots sort of movements, 
movements like the feminist movement, for example, that pushed, among other things, not only women's suffrage, but also an end of child labor laws. Uh, they, they pushed for uh, better working conditions, fair wages for women. Um, there were grassroots movements, of course, the formation of the NAACP occurs during the Progressive Era. So there's a myriad of grassroots, everyday people's activist movements that were demanding reform, and ultimately the vehicle for that reform was the federal government and state and local governments. Uh, the government of Wisconsin, led by fighting Bob La Follette, Robert La Follette, uh, Wisconsin became one of the preeminent progressive states, uh, leading the way on things like unemployment, insurance, um, and so forth. The progressive era was something where the United States government, too, began to be understood as a positive vehicle for uh, reform of society. And, of course, we see this in things like the passage of, uh, the, of the amendment for the direct election of senators, we see this, of course, uh, with the 19th Amendment of women's right to vote. You see this, of course, with a myriad of, uh, of legislation designed to ban, for example, child labor, the emergence of the Pure Food and Drug Act, the Meat Inspection Act, the emergence of the FDA, uh, trust busting and the enforcing of anti-monopoly laws. Um, even, even, we even see the United States government take the probably the first time the United States government under Theodore Roosevelt during the Pennsylvania coal miner strike, we see the United States government effectively support labor, at least partially, in a major in a major labor dispute. Now, the right of workers to unionize is not fully recognized by the government until the 1930s. Um, and there are some very harsh crackdowns on labor during the progressive era. But nonetheless, there were some major steps taken towards recognizing the right of labor to organize, to unionize, and to collectively bargain. So this is an incredibly significant time. It is the time period in which the Grand Canyon is preserved um, as, a, as, as, a, as a natural wonder of the United States, so it wouldn't be destroyed by mining companies. This is the period in which presidents like Theodore Roosevelt set aside more national forest land than any other president. Um, so this is an incredible period of reform as the United States tries to deal with the, the ramifications of, of, of a robust and far less regulated industrial capitalism that, of course, was the, the, the model and the reality in the late 1800s. And so the Progressive Era is an example of grassroots activism driving the leaders on the state, local, and also the federal government level to take actions to reform society, to regulate society, and to produce a more fair, equitable, and just society for Americans. And this very much establishes a legacy for the next over a century, the legacy that Americans look to their leaders to reform and to regulate and to do things that improve society. And uh, that is really a legacy that is championed probably most initially by um, the progressive era um, uh, leaders, both at the grassroots and at the higher up levels as well. The era from 1901 to 1921 that includes the presidencies of Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and Woodrow Wilson. Okay, so that's what we're getting into now. We'll be dealing with this for two weeks, and I have recorded lectures for each of those, so please watch those. Now to the factoid before I make this a 15-minute announcement again like, like last week. Um, so the factoid for this week is simple. I'm going to make the factoid about what we've been studying for the first two weeks, and that was the emergence of the American empire. We talked about the sort of push and pull of the United States' emergence as a, as a world power, as an empire. The push being domestic factors. The pull being the international pull, right? Um, like a pull uh, would be the demand to, um, to have a global presence to compete with other world powers or to access markets like the open door to China um, to access resources potentially. That's the pull, or the, the pull from the outward international world that says, uh, at least American policymakers see this as saying that the United States had to become a world power because if they didn't, 
they would be relegated by the because of the role of the other world powers. And so a need to, to have a large navy with ports throughout the world that gave you a, an ability to sort of flex your muscles and to access markets like the China market. Um, those are the pull factors in why the United States becomes an empire, why the United States annexes Hawaii in the late 1890s, why the United States... Um, conquers and annexes the Philippines in the Philippine-American War, the United States was becoming a world power. And some of the reasons for that were the reasons of global national security and global economic interest, uh, which are kind of pull factors. There's also a push in the economic interest as well. But this is a, a pull to become part of the international sort of world of, of global powers. Push factors, and I'll get to this, this fact one, Push factors are the domestic factors that drive policymakers towards um, uh, towards becoming a, a, a world power and seizing colonies and these types of things. Here's the factoid. Kristen Hoganson, who is an award-winning historian and author of a number of books, wrote a book a number of years ago called Fighting for American Manhood. And this was a groundbreaking uh, work of history. And if you go to a school that has an emphasis on American history and foreign relations, you'll definitely read this book if you go to graduate school for that type of a, a, of a discipline. Kristen Hoganson argued that one of the key factors in why the United States like became an empire effectively at, during the Spanish and Philippine American War was actually due to uh, a sense in the United States that the United States basically was facing a crisis of manliness, that effectively constructs of gender in society was driving policymakers to think that they needed to make war in places like the Philippines to encounter, to encounter the savage, if you will, and thereby make Americans more manly. There was a sense that, uh, that Americans had become weak, that the industrial urban lifestyle that expanded during the Gilded Age made American men weak and American men needed to be strong and you became strong by going to war. You became strong by encountering the, the savage and becoming strong in, in, in a more manly society. Hoganson argued that America felt that it was experienced a crisis, a crisis of manliness um, during the, the Gilded Age and that that sense of crisis was a driving force in pushing leaders like Theodore Roosevelt to advocate for war against Spain and ultimately in the Philippines out of a desire to make men in the United States more manly, to strengthen the men of American society. And so Kristen Hoganson argues that a major push for the United States becoming an empire was actually a crisis of manliness in the United States which domestically, too, was a factor in the, the, the founding of the Boy Scouts, the YMCA, uh, college football as well, were all examples of this sort of crisis of manliness that, um, that Hogason demonstrates existed in the United States at this time and which pushed certain American policymakers to uh, promote wars, the wars against Spain, the Philippine-American War, out of a United States for the United out of a desire for the United States to become a strong, manly country, feeling that the United States had somehow lost its strength, had become weaker and more feminine. So in that sense, Hoganson is arguing that gender, constructs of gender, were actually a significant push in the formation of the, Amer the United States as a world power, and that in fact a crisis of manliness was a significant push driving policymakers to um, make the decisions that they did. So Kristen Hoganson, fighting for American manhood, the role of manliness and gender in pushing American policymakers to make uh, decisions that lead to the United States becoming a global world power. I hope that makes sense. Uh, just give me a brief summary of that. You could just say Kristen Hoganson, fighting for American manly manliness, uh, for your extra credit factoid, email it to me no later than Wednesday by midnight. Get your bonus point. Let's have a great week. And look, I made the video 15 minutes again. I apologize. I will try to make those shorter in the future.